Warning, this podcast is NSFW, nimbly saying fuck words. This week's episode of The Scathing Atheist is brought to you by Honey and by Potpourri. Is your national reputation laden with the foul stench of sadistic mistreatment and murder of indigenous children for generations? Sure, you could reform in some meaningful way to fix the system that led to that abuse, but why not just cover it up with a generous application of the Pope looking very, very contrite next to Native Americans in your country? Potpourri. When you want it to stop stinking, but not bad enough to take out the trash. And now, The Scathing Atheist. Hi, I'm Sebastian from Germany. East Germany, to be precise, where we have our own problems with right-wing and religious politics. And after 20 years as a social worker and raising a son as a single parent, I can definitely assure you that we did in fact evolve from filthy monkey men. It's July 28th. And it's National Refreshment Day. Ah, I'm no illusions. <laughs> um, Heath Enright, and from Ann Arbor, Michigan, and Waycross, Georgia, this is The Scathing Atheist. On this week's episode, Democrats defend marriage from the Defense of Marriage Act. Marjorie Taylor Greene threatens to tell Dad if people don't stop taking her stickers. <laughs> and Marsh will be here to fill in for Eli, but he won't do the voice. Trust me. I asked <laughs> hard. I asked hard. <laughs> but first, the diatribe. When I was in high school, the teachers used to brag about ignoring church-state separation. There was a story a lot of them told about a nearby county, and it was probably apocryphal because it wasn't always the same county, where they did an opening prayer over the PA system before the high school football games. And according to the legend, somebody complained about it and made them stop. So instead of a prayer, the PA would announce a moment of silence, and then they would cue a preacher who was parked just off a of school property with a microphone hooked up to a loudspeaker, and he would offer up a prayer that the whole stadium could still hear. Ha ha, gotcha, the Constitution. And based on nearly 10 years experience doing this show and reporting on flagrant church state violations in schools across the country, it doesn't seem like shit's gotten much better in the intervening 20 years. And that is the environment that we just unleashed the Bremerton decision into. A country where teachers routinely told students which loopholes they'd use to subvert their rights. A country where teachers put up prayer walls in the back of class, where coaches led their public school teams in worship already, and school board meetings opened with exclusively Christian prayers every fucking week. That was what it was before all that shit was legal. Of course, we were told at the time of the Bremerton decision by both the majority and their apologists, that this wasn't going to change things since the coach at the heart of this case was just engaged in a private moment of religious observation after the game. That was always illegal. But that was a fucking lie. Right? If you don't believe me, just look at the photographs that Sonia Sotomayor included in her dissent. But th th it wasn't just us who realized that was a fucking lie. Right? The, the, the evangelical teachers, coaches, administrators, and school board members also noticed when the SCOTUS described Coach Kennedy's huge fucking prayer rallies as, quote, private religious speech, end quote, what they heard was, I don't see no church state violation, wink, wink. And they're clearly running with that message. The Washington Post did a story about it this week where they highlighted the weird world that schools have to navigate now. I've got the story linked in the show notes, but the key takeaway is that school superintendents across the country are revisiting their policies about teacher led prayer. And let's take a second to reflect on what an admission that is. Right. Because if the majority was being honest in their description of the facts and it really was just a private moment of prayer that Kennedy was taking after the games, why the fuck would anybody feel the need to revisit policies about teachers leading their classes in prayer? And yet we've already got reports out of Alabama, Illinois, Michigan and Oregon about school personnel doing exactly that. And the, uh, the Washington Post article quotes quite a bit from FFRF co-president Annie Laurie Gaylor talking about how hard it already was to get schools to abide by the Constitution in the before times. But far more damning are all the spots where they quote the advocates for teacher and coach led prayer. 
Like there's this dude, Bill DeFrance, who's the superintendent of Eaton Rapids Public Schools in Michigan. And he was eager to pilot an official prayers in public school sports program. He even sold it as a way of embracing religious diversity. No shit. He said, quote, I could see some real interesting things like, OK, Bill, you're a Hindu. You lead the prayer this week and give some background about why Hindus pray, end quote. It would be more realistic if he had suggested the new policy would allow the students to sprout wings and fucking fly. I mean, don't get me wrong. I'm sure Bill, the hypothetical Hindu kid, would love an opportunity to better emphasize how different he is from his high school peers in case they weren't sure who to beat up later. But you take fucking Karen's Christian kid and lead him in Hindu prayer one fucking time, and you might as well invite a torch and pitchfork vendor to set up shop in your front yard. There's no fucking way it plays out like that. An official prayer at a public school will either be explicitly Christian, or it'll be one of those pseudo non-sectarian things where they leave out Jesus's name, but still assume all the theological structures of Christianity within the prayer. And if there was, by the way, if there was any danger of it being otherwise, there's no fucking way the Christian parents or the high court's conservatives would have endorsed it in the first place. But it goes beyond that, right? Because we're not just talking about teachers and coaches leading their students in prayer. We're also talking about them evangelizing to the class. If you think that teachers won't take advantage of this ruling to add also Jesus is your Lord and Savior to the algebra lesson plan, then clearly you haven't been paying attention to our headlines for very long. The, the WAPO article also quotes heavily from Christy Frega. She, uh, she's a school board member in Florida that we talked about back in episode 479 when she accidentally admitted that her call for a statewide day of prayer in schools was meant to be exclusively Christian. And she's already talking about how to use this ambiguity to add evangelism to the history curriculum. From the article, quote, I would love to see there be ability to implement more religious teachings. There's lessons that are taught right now in schools that maybe certain families do not believe in. She, she means evolution. And students have to sit there and listen to what history has brought to us. Why not also offer lessons on the Christianity, the religion that has formed our nation, as well as the different types of religion? End quote. See, even the fucking quote speaks to the impossibility of doing such a thing neutrally. She can't even express the intent without ranking the relative importance of the various religions. No, the, the Native American faith had nothing to do with our nation's founding. Uh, America's Jews, Muslims, Hindus, deists, atheists, no real contribution worthy of note there. In her mind, and if she has her way in the minds of her students, Christianity and Christianity alone was the religion that has formed our nation. This fight is already ugly and it's about to get a lot uglier. In much of the country, schools are starting back in the next week or two, and nobody knows exactly what these new rules are. If doing this show has taught me anything, it's that Christians are going to take advantage of that ambiguity and push their religion as hard as they think they can get away with. If you've got kids going to public schools, you need to be aware of this shit. You need to make your kids aware of it. You need to make sure that they know what few rights they still have left whenever their teachers start sermonizing in the middle of class, because trust me, that will happen. And I'm sorry to be the one to tell you, but in a lot of ways, we're the last line of defense. They're talking about your Jesus. We interrupt this broadcast and bring you a special news bulletin. Joining me for headlines tonight are the tomato and tomato to Mike calling the whole thing off. He then writes Michael Marshall Phillips. <laughs> Shall we dance? You called off. You said you called off. I'm very scared of dancing. I don't like this. <laughs> you know, we can dance. Maybe we could dance the uh, Lombada. Sorry, the Lombada. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Square <in> America. <laughs> in our lead story tonight, we actually have some good news, believe it or not. Hmm. U.S. House of Representatives voted to pass the Respect for Marriage Act, which would prevent the Supreme Court majority of theocratic bigots from ending federal protection for same-sex marriage by overturning the Obergefell versus Hodges decision of 2015. The bill passed with a vote of 267 to 157, with yes votes from every Democrat and 47 Republicans, actually. So in very simple terms, the bill says people are people. Yes, everywhere in the country. Yes, that includes whatever place you're about to name. Hands down, please. Your state is in everywhere in the country. Yes, it is. It's embarrassing that any of this had to happen. But, Marsh, I assure you, this is actually good news, <laughs> at least within the context of the hot garbage that is American culture. Even though it'll die in the Senate. Yes. 
<sighs> you know, it's it's such a shame that Eli had to miss this show because he's got a whole list of things in the Senate he'd like to see die. I mean, <laughs> it, it, it's at least 157 <laughs> items long. <laughs> and uh, just to elaborate on that hot garbage I was talking about, the bill doesn't even tell every state that they have to allow and license any marriage, regardless of the penis count. It should. It should fucking say that. And we already have a federal law that says that. It's called the um, uh, the 14th Amendment. Helped end slavery. It was kind of a big deal. Maybe you've heard of it. But in order to prevent that same bigot majority on the Supreme Court from just striking down the new law, we had to do this absurd bigotry tolerance dance in the wording and write a law that just says every state has to respect the marriage laws of other states and make it a state's rights angle, which is something every state already does with opposite sex marriage without even thinking about it. Yeah. Yeah. Geez, our, our conservatives are so dangerously stupid that like them without thought is the preferred state. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And it, it's genuinely obscene that the only way you can get a law past your Supreme Court is via the what would the other states say was true routine. <laughs> <laughs> like they're the guards who always lie. Yep. Which, yeah. which they kind of literally are. That's, that is yeah, literally what they are. That's, that's the job. Six out of the nine of them. Sure is. So as usual with news about American politics, when it's good news, it's also bad news. The good news, 47 House Republicans voted for the 14th Amendment. So that's good, I guess. And when you compare that to the Defense of Marriage Act of 1996 or DOMA, this vote shows a big drop off in normalized homophobia that law doma defined marriage at the federal level as one man and one woman and specifically allowed any state to violate the 14th amendment and refuse to recognize same-sex marriage the new law would overturn doma just for the record doma passed in the house in 1996 by a vote of 342 to 67 jesus and it passed in the senate 85 to 14 which is disgusting well, Marsh, again, it's good news. We're somewhat less disgusting now. So <laughs> that's fun. That's our sad win condition in America <laughs> in 2022. Wind, that is the best our country could realistically hope for as a Yelp review, right? <laughs> somewhat less disgusting now. Yeah. All right. Well, that brings us to the bad news. Mm. Yes, 47 House Republicans voted for the new law, but that means... 110 House Republicans did not. So if you're keeping score at home, more than 25% of the U.S. House of Representatives is a literal hate group. And we need to say that every day. That needs to be every headline in every section of the news all the time. Like the Fed plans to bump interest rates and 25% of the House is a literal hate group. Chonky Pug walks in park and 25% of the House is a literal hate group. Every Story. We never stop talking about it. Yeah, but you're assuming that being a little hate group isn't a feature, not a bug for some of their voters, because otherwise those headlines basically just become free advertising. <laughs> That's <laughs> true. true. Yeah. It's really hard. There's no irony anymore. Also worth noting, the Christian right is freaking out because 47 assumed loyal bigots broke ranks. So a bunch of talking heads made official statements being like, guys, you're ruining our perfectly good Hey, group, you got to get in line. Looking like idiots now. That includes Todd Starnes, who said the marriage between Republicans and evangelicals is headed for divorce court. So this little angle of it is great news. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But there's like a really solid chance the Supreme Court is going to strike down divorce before they get there. So, <laughs> that's, yeah, that's rough. <laughs> so now all we need to do is pass the bill in the Senate. And that's uh, that's the new formula for the good news here in America. Besides, there's also always bad news. We don't have all the way good news. We have good news pending the Senate. And when when you always seem to have good news pending blank, you should stop having the blank. The Senate needs to go or at least get a big overhaul. I literally don't care what any two people in Wyoming think about anything ever. <laughs> like, okay, I'm sure there's good ones there. There's a few. The good ones are going to get represented just fine by the non-bigot Congress people from other states. Not go. once in my life have I been thinking about an issue and I said to myself, you know what? I'd love to get some input from Wyoming about this. No, never. Of course not. 
Yeah, I mean, to be honest, up until this point, whenever you guys had mentioned Wyoming, Wyoming I just assumed you were talking about a made-up place to fuck with me, like when Eli starts naming <laughs> British towns. I did not think that was a real place. <laughs> right. Yet Wyoming and its half a million people has the same influence as California and its 40 million people in the most powerful legislative body in the country. But regardless, this bill might have a shot outside chance. We only need 10 Republican senators mm. to push it through past a filibuster. And either way, this is finally a wedge issue in the Republican Party, and we made them vote on it. They can't decide which bigotry to focus on, and it's pandemonium over there. <laughs> Let's keep that fracture going. Amen. I like guess middle school, just fight, 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 whenever we can get them to fight. <laughs> And in UK gets cold fetus news, <laughs> more than 20 countries signed an official statement committing to protecting women's rights in an international conference in London this month, only to find out that after they signed the statement, the government removed any references to sexual and reproductive health and rights and bodily autonomy from the statement, raising fears that the UK was starting to distance itself from abortion rights. What well, what could possibly be a different explanation they were trying to nail the word count <laughs> <laughs> yeah no no it's not about bodily autonomy for us we just really hate fetuses it's just <laughs> about that it's a really weird take uh, and the thing is how this commitment to protecting women's rights got removed from the statement isn't yet clear but i imagine someone regretted that it was there and figured they just weren't ready for that kind of commitment yet. And that, you know, it's still early enough to remove the, remove that safely before it became a much more serious thing to have to deal with. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. something that might say ruin all the plans they had for the future. <laughs> yeah. All those words were in the first trimester of the statement. It's cool. <laughs> Get rid of them. And, and fingers have been pointing to the conservative MP, Fiona Bruce, who was heavily involved in this conference. She's also the co-chair of the all party parliamentary pro-life group of MPs which is a group that is sponsored by the anti-abortion charity Right to Life UK. Ugh. Well, mm. not to not to undercut your story, Marsh, I'm just but I'm jealous as hell that this is a scandal where you are. <laughs> <laughs> but the thing is, th this is a parliamentary group that includes about a dozen anti-abortion MPs. Not all of the anti-abortion MPs, but there's a dozen of them who are willing to sit on an actual group and committee about them. And most of these cite their religious faith as the reason for their membership of this group. But so far, their influence has been fairly minimal because the UK doesn't really have this whole history of populist politicians using abortion rights and faith positions as cultural to all wedge issues. Really leaning into that MP, I see. <laughs> mm, secular government, socialized medicine, feels so good on my skin. That's you. That's what you sound like. <laughs> well, bear in mind, this can all change pretty quickly. We've got a collapsing government that's increasingly desperate for scapegoats that they can use to distract voters from all the, all the things that are going on. And it's, it's just not inconceivable that reproductive health care will be the next thing they choose to turn into an issue. Okay, as mottos go... Mega is definitely better than MAGA. You got to stay vigilant. That's <laughs> so much better. It's so much yeah, better. It is. Because as, as you guys in America recently reminded us, reproductive rights are only ever as strong as the political will to defend them. And given that the person who's ultimately in charge of the UK's participation in this conference where this statement was produced was the Foreign Secretary Liz Truss, who is now currently involved in a very ugly two-way scrap for the keys to number 10 Downing Street and to be the next prime minister. Really? Yeah, I don't think we can take anything for granted right about now. Woof. Yikes. And in Jewel Be Sorry news tonight, Robin Hood didn't have to give to the poor to be the good guy in that story. Right? Like, there's just, there's a kind of rich where just depriving them of wealth is morally justified, even if you're just enriching yourself. <laughs> Some might argue that that's all kinds of rich, but I feel like we can all agree that crusade engorged 12th century English nobility is that kind of rich. Yep. Yep. Mm -hmm. With you. Mm -hmm. And I'm equally sure that we can all agree prosperity preacher who wears a literal million dollars worth of jewelry while fleecing his congregants is also that kind of rich. Two votes. Yep. Which is why I'm happy to report that Brooklyn Bishop Lamar Miller Whitehead was robbed at gunpoint in the middle of a live stream oh, yeah. sermon That's last Sunday. Funny. That's pretty funny. In which three gunmen absconded with over a million dollars worth of jewelry from Miller Whitehead and his wife. Okay, the Bible says a rich person going to heaven is less likely than a camel walking through the eye of a needle. So mm -hmm. this was sincerely held robbery, right? <laughs> I'm pretty sure that's legal if you're Christian, according to the Supreme Court. 
Yeah, I totally agree. I mean, the problem with Raskolnikov in Crime and Punishment was only ever a question of scale. Like, at a certain <laughs> level of worth, he is unequivocally the good guy in that story. He's right. He's absolutely right. right. Absolutely. Now, to be clear, <laughs> I'm not endorsing armed robbery against preachers. And according to Andrew, I'm also not endorsing unarmed Danny Ocean-style heists against them either. <laughs> I will. He never lets me have any fun. But I'm also not shedding any tears for this asshole either. I, I, I do have sympathy for his infant daughter, who the assailants apparently pointed a gun to while robbing his wife, which is pretty fucked up. But to their credit, unlike Miller Whitehead, they did not go on to rob the congregation. Right? They just took the jewelry and ran. Actually, they didn't even run. They got in a car and drove off in Brooklyn traffic, I guess. So, <laughs> so statistically, this robbery barely increased the number of robberies to take place in that room on a daily basis. <laughs> like, right. It probably even brought the number down if the robbery happened before the collection plate was handed around. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but next week, the bishop finds like 36 degrees of a bunch of gold rings and chains in the collection plate. Okay. <laughs> okay that's, that's reason they're tithing it back. That's pretty funny. <laughs> it's pretty funny if they rob us again and then they do like 3.6. All right. Uh. <laughs> so after the robbery, Miller Whitehead talked to reporters and said that he could feel a demonic presence in the church the moment that they walked in. Of course, he also said, quote, when I see them coming into the sanctuary with their guns, I told everybody to get out and quote, forgetting apparently that the whole thing was live streamed. <laughs> right. So we know good and damn well that no, the fuck he didn't. He just cowered in place until they were done. He's such a bad liar. Right. Look, I mean, look, to be fair, that's, I'm sure that's, I would have peed myself and just sat there until they were done. But I also wouldn't have followed up by pretending that my first response was to think of others. <laughs> also, Rudy Giuliani was there. Uh, he got shot in the back with a bazooka. It was great. <laughs> nope. Nope. Where's this cameras? <laughs> nope. nope. Not what I said. Anyway, Miller Whitehead has offered a $50,000 reward for information leading to the arrest of the robber. So clearly he's doing fine without that particular million dollars worth of doubtlessly insured bling. And with your guilt thusly assuaged, we're going to take a quick break and hand things over to my lovely wife, Lucinda. A man wrote the Bible. A whore is what she was. If it's a legitimate rape. If it's a slut, right? It, cooking can be fun. Hey, I'm proud of a man. This week in Massachusetts. All right, I'll admit, it's been a pretty depressing year to be an American feminist. I mean, they're all pretty depressing going all the way back to 1776, but this one kind of stands out compared to the other ones I've lived through. And it's in times like these that everybody needs a little good news to keep them going. And believe it or not, I actually have a bit of that for you this week. We're going to start in one of the least likely places to find good feminism news in 2022, Kentucky. See, back in 2019, state Republicans passed one of those abortion trigger laws we've been hearing so much about recently, the Human Life Protection Act. In addition to winning several most bullshit hyperbolic law name awards, also banned all abortion unless it would save the life of the mother. There is no exception for rape or incest. And of course, since that was all still unconstitutional in 2019, but everybody knew the Trump appointee laden court was about to change that, this was passed with a pending legality asterisk. Now, I know that doesn't sound like the lead into a good news story, but last Friday, Jefferson Circuit Judge Mitch Perry issued an injunction that prevented the law from going into effect and allowed abortions to continue in the state. And while I don't think his injunction will be enough to save pregnant people in Kentucky for long, it's nice to know somebody is holding the line. But it's also worth highlighting because of his reasoning. See, Perry argued that the law was inherently religious since it's rooted in the idea that life begins at conception. That's a religious idea that not only doesn't come from science, but can't reasonably be reconciled with science. So by Perry's reckoning, forcing pregnant people to abide by that law is a violation of the religious freedom. Of course, even our good news usually comes with bad news. Like I was excited to see a story last week about the Mennonites in Canada making moves to try to draw more women into the ministry, which is pretty cool. They even commissioned a book that collected essays from women in church leadership meant to inspire other women to take up the mantle. Which, sure, it would be better if they just weren't religious, but if women are going to be religious, at the very least, they should be in religious leadership. So, partial kudos to the Mennonites. Made all the more partial because apparently they censored the fuck out of one of the essays when Winnipeg pastor Mary Ann Isaac had the audacity to spend a chunk of her essay talking about LGBTQ inclusion. 
So yeah, they're making progress, I guess, but they're doing it with the park and brakes still engaged. All that being said, I do actually have some unambiguously good news to wrap up on, and it's a story I really wasn't expecting. According to a new analysis from everybody's favorite secular statistician, Ryan P. Burge, when it comes to godlessness in Generation Z, the women actually outnumber the men. That's right, among Zoomers, or at least the ones old enough to be captured in adult data, 49% of women don't identify with any religion compared with 48% of men. Now, that might not seem like a huge gap, but in every previous generation, the men outnumbered the women, and by a lot. It's not hard to imagine why, of course, women have been the targets of a lot more religious bigotry than men. But that was true from my generation as well. And for whatever fucking stupid reason, women were still way more likely to be religious. So that's what I've got for you in terms of good news. Now sucks, yes, but the kids are all right. And on that note, I'll hand you back over to Noah, Heath, and Marsh. Thank you, Lucinda. (laughs) And next up in headlines... Marjorie Taylor Greene is losing a prank war really hard right now, (laughs) and it's fucking delightful. For the last year and a half, she's been putting up bigotry posters on the wall outside her congressional office. That includes one we talked about last year that said, there are two genders, male and female, trust the science, exclamation point. Well, it turns out there's an American hero somewhere in that building where her office is, and her posters keep getting vandalized or removed. This is amazing. Oh, it is. It's so good. So good. And it's also incredibly bold of her to go with a trust the science message. Cause I just really hope people start vandalizing it by like pinning onto the, the sign, onto the poster papers about climate change or uh, <laughs> evolution or right. literally anything in science yeah. ever. Gender science. That would be persecution. Yeah. <laughs> I really hope they do that too. So after her latest poster got taken down last week, MTG had a big huffy meltdown and claimed she's the victim of a hate crime because somebody messed up her hate crime. Yeah, lady, getting mad about your posters getting taken down. That's a thing that other adults have also done. You're fine. (laughs) Very befitting of a member of fucking Congress. (laughs) So MTG has a theory that her poster nemesis is a guy named Tim Heisem, the chief of staff for Democrat Jake Oakenclass. And she figured the best way to handle that was to put up a poster accusing Tim Heisem of messing with her posters, which is the dumbest possible response. And it makes me so happy. She spent a bunch of time and effort designing this new poster and printing it up at Kinko's on overpriced, glossy oak tag that she bought And then it got taken down right away again. (laughs) So in response, she posted a video in that, you know, the angry, soft talking voice about how I put up a poster with my legal rights of poster law. And now it is gone. (laughs) She's pointing at the spot where it used to be. Oh, God. And I really hope that the social media platforms take down her post of that video. And then she's going to make like another video talking about her previous (laughs) post got taken down. (laughs) Okay. You're making a joke, but it kind of goes like that. So... She also claimed that the Capitol Police issued an arrest warrant for Tim Heisem after they caught him vandalizing the transphobic poster from last year. And she added, quote, they've been attacking this sign, Tim Heisem. So oddly enough, she seems fine using they them pronouns for Tim Heisem there. (laughs) Just now for people who actually use they them pronouns. Interesting. I imagine like there's some poor sergeant at arms somewhere going like, Mrs. Taylor Green, I don't know how else to tell you that the House of Representatives doesn't have a manager. I just, I get, <laughs> I've said this. We brought out the charts, the work chart. And just in case anyone was feeling disappointed that the amazing string of MTG failures might come to an end, don't worry. MTG made two more videos that day, which all but guarantee this thing keeps going. <laughs> in the second video of the day, she reported that one of her aides found the stolen poster in the garbage of the men's bathroom. And then she goes out of her way to mention it was a male staffer who found the evidence. She actually said, quote, I don't go to the men's bathroom. I go to the women's bathroom. <laughs> and I, I would feel sorry for that staffer, but sifting through the garbage of a men's bathroom is, is technically a promotion from working for MTG. <laughs> that's, that's a step up the ladder. 
Yep. And then she made a third video. In the third video, she puts up yet another copy of the poster about Tim Heisem. <laughs> so we'll see how that goes. Maybe the Capitol Police, you know, maybe they really love Marjorie Taylor Greene and they'll mm -hmm. be super vigilant about protecting her poster. Or maybe it's already gone again. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Regardless, whoever's doing this, Tim Heisem, whoever it might be, please escalate this. Keep taking down the hate crime posters for sure, but really start ramping it up. I'm, like, get creative. I want to hear yeah. about new stuff. No, right now, if you if you need a retaliatory poster, we'll talk to Angelo. We can we can work something out with you, Tim. <laughs> <laughs> and in Stephen C. Minor news, <laughs> the stunning images from the James Webb Telescope earlier this month gave us all a view of how the universe looked some 13 billion years ago. However, not to be outdone, Newsweek magazine managed to go one better last week by giving us a view somehow even more outdated. <laughs> in, in an op-ed from creationist and director of the Discovery Institute, Stephen C. Meyer. Ah, uh, Newsweek repeatedly proving that there is to a lower since 2010. <laughs> <laughs> so this article, titled How Science Stopped Backing Atheists and Started Pointing Back to God, ran in Fuck Newsweek's you. opinion section. Get out of here. That's... <laughs> Oh my God. <laughs> it ran in Newsweek's opinion section, presumably only because the magazine doesn't have a fiction section. That's what I'm guessing. <laughs> okay. Good rule of thumb. If an article describes scientific data as having political opinions <laughs> and being fickle with those political opinions, <laughs> you're an idiot who's reading Newsweek on Ironic. Yeah. 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 When one scientific data is essentially a floating voter, you've got a problem <laughs> with your reading material. So in this article, uh, Maya notes that while religious belief is falling, the reason for that drop off uh, in belief in God in America is actually that all those silly atheists and agnostics and religiously unaffiliated simply misunderstand the science. Because according to Maya, the very latest scientific discoveries actually tell a, quote, decidedly more God-friendly story, unquote. What? Then what? More than Gore the God Butcher? <laughs> <laughs> so what are these groundbreaking, atheism-shaking, disciple-making scientific discoveries, you might wonder? I was wondering. Yeah, yeah. Well, in order of appearance, they are the Big Bang started the universe. Number two, the fundamental laws of the universe are specifically what they are. Interesting. And number three, and I, and I want to make sure I'm not misunderstanding this one here. Molecular biology has proven that RNA is basically the same as nanotechnology, and therefore it must have been programmed by God, and even Richard Dawkins admits it. That's <laughs> <laughs> right, right. So if your atheism was cemented before the Big Bang Theory was proposed in 1931, <laughs> strap the fuck in. Meyer has some new shit to show you. <laughs> Just wait until you hear about FM radio and nylon. So Meyer's big three slam dunk new arguments to prove that science now points towards the existence of God amount to nothing more than the cosmological argument, the fine tuning argument and the argument from design with a dash of, quote, at the very least, the discoveries are not what anyone would have expected from blind materialistic processes, unquote, a.k.a. the argument from incredulity. Right. Yep. I actually invited the article to Thanksgiving, and you can see a handful of slur words forming at the end, like the opposite of Back to the Future kind of. So does, does this article really prove that there is an intelligent creator behind the universe? Well, given how he's half heartedly cobbled together three of the oldest creationist talking points, if you ask me, Stephen C. Meyer doesn't even convincingly prove that there's an intelligent creator behind this article. <laughs> <laughs> or the entire publication, actually. <laughs> And finally tonight, in electile dysfunction news, with Donald Trump, the GOP presidential frontrunner for 2024, Herschel Walker on a senatorial ballot, and Doug Mastriano in danger of becoming Pennsylvania's next governor, I kind of assumed I was numb to the holy shit, look at the lunatic who won this primary kind of news items. I was wrong. <laughs> Because holy fucking shit, y'all, none other than Michael Porowka just won the GOP primary and became the Republican candidate for Maryland's attorney general. All right. So we've talked about him on the show before, but in case that name doesn't ring a bell, Porowka is the asshole that donated the million dollar Allosaurus skeleton to Ken Ham's Creationist Museum and once dismissed charges of racism by pointing out that the real racism is abortion. Ugh. He's also a, an avowed secessionist and Christian nationalist who said it that accepting evolution makes you a traitor. <clears throat> oh, and he's also buddies with Roy Moore. Oof. 
Yeah, those are actually the bullet points on his resume to get a job at Newsweek when he loses the election. <laughs> Everything you just said. It's perfect. So, yeah, so Peroka has taken an unusual route towards this domination. He's a neo-Confederate, read bad guy in the Civil War apologist, whose highest previous elected office was chairman of the Anne Arundel County Council in Annapolis. Okay, okay. The Anne Arundel Annapolis. Now, you are absolutely definitely making that these place names to fuck with me. Like, what did Andrew say about bullying the foreign guy? It's not allowed. It's not allowed. Um, okay, your country has a 58-letter city name that ends in go 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 All right, Fair. sit down. Anyway, Peroka is also a former board member of the League of the South, a group classified by the Southern Poverty Law Center as white supremacist and white nationalist. He calls separation of church and state the big lie. Okay, but on that last one, presumably he just got advance notice of the Supreme Court's 2023 decision. Well, yeah, maybe. (sighs) Also, when he ran for president as the Constitution Party's candidate in 2004, he received endorsements from the America First Party, the Alaskan Independence Party, that Sarah Palin's husband's party, and Alex fucking Jones. Also, he kind of stole that Allosaurus skeleton in a story so convoluted and bizarre I could damn near do a citation needed essay on it. <laughs> Yeah, ironically, he teamed up with Mark Meadows yes! to steal that <laughs> skeleton. Even though Meadows is usually a um, like a stop the steal type of guy, right? <laughs> <laughs> or at least not reported on his official documents. Of course, the silver <laughs> lining whenever someone this extreme wins a primary is that it radically increases the chances that the reasonable candidate on the other side of the ballot is going to win. In fact, Democrats are banking on that in a lot of races where they actually promoted candidates that they deemed too unqualified, extreme or stupid to win. But that seems like a really odd tactic, you know, especially when voters find out you were doing it, because then your campaign becomes, hey, vote for us. We back the other guy. Uh, Right. (laughs) (laughs) Well, but also like as the pronounced national limp that we're dealing with reminds us every fucking minute of every day, there is no amount of unqualified, extreme or stupid that is enough to guarantee a loss. Mm. Right. And in the face of any real chance that a lunatic like Michael Perautka could achieve a position of power, the proper emotional response is terror and dread. Anyway, that's what passes for a happy ending these days. So I guess we'll close out the headlines there. Heath Marsh. Thanks as always. Keep taking down those posters, whoever you are. (laughs) And when we come back, we're going to find out that being hungry like a wolf isn't all it's cracked up to be. Today's episode is sponsored by PayPal Honey. And got it. All packed up. Hey, Heath, what you doing? Is that a a bag of 200 socks? 200, yes. Yes, it is. And on the table over here, those are... Three overripe cantaloupes? Three overripe cantaloupes, correct. Nice. They look perfect. Uh-huh. You, you doing a barter deal? Yeah, I, I actually am. I, I'm trying to get a couch for my apartment. People keep saying, like, you need more than just one chair in your apartment. Blah, blah, blah. You're a grown-up. People have to have chairs. So I went on one of those online marketplaces, and I found someone willing to trade a couch for exactly 200 socks and three overripe cantaloupes. Sounds like a fair trade. But going forward, why don't you just try Honey? Oh, what's Honey? Honey is the free shopping tool that scours the internet for promo codes and applies the best one it finds to your cart. It supports over 30,000 stores online, ranging from tech and gaming products to popular fashion brands and even food delivery. Great. So how does it work? Imagine you're shopping on one of your favorite sites. When you check out, the Honey button drops down and all you have to do is click Apply Coupons. Then you just wait a few seconds as Honey searches for coupons it can find for that site. If Honey finds a working coupon, you'll watch the prices drop. Okay. Well, now that I know about Honey, I got to say, I'm straight up feeling a bit of the FOMO. Well, that makes perfect sense because if you don't already have Honey, you could be straight up missing out. It's literally free and installs in a few seconds. And by getting it, you'll be doing yourself a solid and supporting this podcast. I'd never recommend something I don't use. With Honey, I saved $25 last week when I was shopping for pet supplies. It was super easy. So where do I go to get honey? Get honey for free at joinhoney.com slash scathing. That's joinhoney.com slash scathing. Fantastic. I'm in. Uh, Question. Can you give me a ride to the abandoned warehouse on the outskirts of town really quick? You're you're still doing the barter thing? Yeah. yeah, I already agreed to meet up, so I'm going to do it. All right, fine. Can you give me a hand loading up this couch? Yeah, no problem. Wait a second. Why why do you want... None of your business. Okay. On your business. A 
A lot of people in the world of atheism and skepticism urge us to attack the ideas and not the people. And while I understand that sentiment under some circumstances, I feel like much of the time it underestimates just how shitty some of these people are, which we're going to be reminded of once again in this installment of Who's Woo? Formerly known as Whom's Bullshit, is it? Because I was off that week. So, Marsh, who are we going to be learning about today? David Avocado Wolf. Oh, I'm so excited. Okay, <laughs> good. So who is David Avocado Wolf? So David Wolf was born in San Diego, California. His father, Gerald Wolf, was an osteopath who lost his medical license when he and David's mother, Maureen Fooey Wolf, fabricated details of medical tests in order to fraudulently claim an extra $3 million from Medicare. So his father was a doctor, but most of his doctoring was of medical records. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and just to be clear, his father was a doctor and also an osteopath. Like, mm. he learned medicine and also non-Euclidean medicine in some sort of <laughs> theoretical hyperbolic <laughs> ellipse universe or whatever. Yep. Yeah, your country has a ridiculous way of handling osteopaths. It makes no sense to the rest of the world. It's only one of the many things that we look down on you for. Anyway, <laughs> um, at the age of 19, David developed an interest in nutrition when he discovered that he was lactose intolerant. And he explains, quote, I found that out myself. I didn't get it from a book, unquote. And this autodidact don't trust books attitude is, is kind of odd coming from somebody who'd go on to write and sell more than a dozen nutrition books of his own. <laughs> and maybe his point is you just, you can't trust the books that he didn't write. Sure. Well, I, but, but to be fair, like it would have been really fucking weird if he came across a book that said, by the way, you, David Wolf, are lactose intolerant. That's the kind of thing you don't learn from a book. <laughs> He's just drinking a gallon of milk and projectile vomiting. I'm an autodidact. <clears throat> Books are for suckers. <laughs> I learned this myself. Uh, the thing is, while he, he may well look down on book learning, he does seem to appreciate the value of a good education because he claims to hold, quote, degrees in mechanical and environmental engineering and political science from, quote, many different institutions, including Oxford University. What? Uh, close quote. <laughs> Though most of the institutions that he cites as the, the place where he got those degrees have told reporters They've never fucking heard of him. And his time oh. at Oxford University amounts to a course open to the general public called The Origins of Metaphysics in Pre-Socratic Philosophy, which David took part in in 2012 and failed to even finish. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Yeah, rare that a legitimate academic credential has a including but not limited to clause in <laughs> <Right>? it. <laughs> I went to school at uh, Hard Knocks U and also the college with the TV ads and the scrolling text about all the programs and uh, uh, Hacky Sack Circle at Oxford University. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you know what? I heard it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say Oxford at Al. That's uh, <laughs> going to sound better. Uh, you are, you are so close to the reality there, Heath, because it, you know, it's not to say that he's fabricated his entire educational history, but because he does have a qualification in nutrition from the University of Integrated Science, California. Oh, Jesus. No. And I guess so. he went for nutrition because it was either major in that or opt for one of their other genuine courses, like Tachyon Holistic Wellness <laughs> or <laughs> Vertical Reality 101 um, or, or the Veganic Master Program, which is also one of their courses. <laughs> Okay, they also literally have a Tantra department, which sounds <laughs> they do. way more scientific than everything Marsh just said. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, but Wolf's big break came with his first book in, in 1998. It was a co-authored dieting guide called Nature's First Law, The Raw Food Diet. And this 218-page book took three authors to write. <laughs> there was Wolf, there was Stephen Arlen, and there was Fuad Zini. And according to Amazon, fun fact about this book, Customers who bought the book also bought a 10 kilogram bucket of food grade magnesium sulfate Epsom salt. <laughs> so, listener, <laughs> listener, Marsh has inserted a picture from Amazon to back up that claim in the notes because he loves me back. <laughs> how, how could I leave that out? How could I leave that out? But even though, you know, nature's first law of the book, it was a product of three clearly brilliant minds. There was actually a fourth collaborator whose contribution for a very long time went completely unrecognized in that the whole entire book was a barely disguised plagiarism of a 1960s book <laughs> called Raw Eating, which was written by Arshavir Terhovanesian. And it kind of looks like what they did was the three guys who wrote the 1998 version, it took the three of them to run the first version through a thesaurus 
because they're really, really similar. For example, here's the intro para, or one of the intro paras to the original book from 1960. It says, the habit of eating cooked food should be abandoned in this world once and for all. This is the unerring demand of nature. And then the wolf et al version Humanity's habit of eating cooked food must be abandoned in, in this world once and for all. This what? is the absolute command of nature. <laughs> oh, Changed it, technically. <laughs> yeah. And according to Wolf, this is all absolutely fine. Absolutely fine. Because for one, he did acknowledge the contribution of the original author oh, in okay. the third reprint of the book. So <laughs> not, okay. not so much the first two of that plagiarism. <laughs> Plus he points out the original author was so obscure that David was doing him a favor by promoting his work without naming or crediting him. It was a, yes. it was a big favor. <laughs> no, it's like when you offer to let a band play at your event for free. Yeah, no. Right. <laughs> and your event already happened in the past. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it was around about this time that David took on the pseudonymous middle name of Avocado, including in a, in a failed 2004 reality TV show called Mad Mad House. What is happening here? Okay. <laughs> Once again, Marsh gave us a visual aid in the notes showing mm -hmm. the cast of Mad Mad House. Mm -hmm. And based on what we've heard so far, it's entirely unclear whether David Avocado Wolf is the vampire in this sh in this shot or the bird pirate or the Mad Max henchman. Is that <laughs> yeah. what I'm looking at? Yep. I think yep. I think he's the, the latter of those. He's the guy in the bottom corner there. So you can, yeah. you can yeah. see bird whichever pirate. one you want to. Bird pirate. Yeah. Okay, yeah. got it. So when it comes to promoting and endorsing pseudoscience, it, it's genuinely hard to find a wacky idea that David hasn't endorsed. His greatest hits include things genuinely so bonkers that I can't even tell what he was going for when he said it. So he claimed that mushroom spores came from space, which is why you often find mushroom spores floating around the upper atmosphere <laughs> because what? they float to Earth originally from other planets carried on cosmic <laughs> waves. And, and they're a little homesick, so they floated up kind of <laughs> high, closer to the space. Yeah. No, I get it. I get yeah, it. That makes sense. sense. Although there was the time that he explained that when it comes to solar power, he said solar panels are, quote, not renewable. The light that they absorb is lost forever. What is Before happening? posting, like and share if you think draining the sun is a good idea. <laughs> but so he thinks otherwise the sunlight would loop back around? <laughs> What? Fucking what? <laughs> I assume so. Okay. How does he think night works? I'm curious. <laughs> oh, that is a question I would love to put to him. It's one of many questions I would love to put to him. Because <laughs> he's also completely unconvinced about gravity. He said, quote, Gravity is not intrinsic to matter. That Carl no? Sagan idea that was sold to us on Cosmos on PBS was sold to us deliberately to confuse us. There's people who've known that gravity is a force that can be displaced. So according to Wolf, it's only brainwashing that leads us to think that gravity is keeping us on the ground. Okay, he saw The Matrix, got it. 1999, <laughs> yeah, he watched yes. The Matrix, great. And, and speaking of gravity, he's also a believer that salt can help keep us grounded, like literally grounded. He said the salt in our bodies holds in all the water. And he thinks that because salt helps to stop water evaporating, the oceans are therefore only salty in order to keep that water on earth because otherwise, this is a direct quote, the water would levitate right off the earth and that would be the end of it. <laughs> what the fuck's happening? Oh, lakes are going to fuck this guy right up when he first sees one, I'll tell you. <laughs> well, the lakes are held down by all of the photons with the ones that are moving forward, mm -hmm. the forward moving photons, mm -hmm. the ones that are looping back around to hold down the night lakes. <laughs> <laughs> At one point, right, he, when he was selling this raw vegan product that he called sacred chocolate. And I think this is at a time when, as best I can tell, he was referring to himself as Lord Cacao. <laughs> yeah. he, he explained that, quote, chocolate is an octave of sun energy and is made from the male energy at the center of the sun. It's on the same octave as gold. What? Okay, mm. he saw a commercial for Count Chocula while he was on acid in 1999. <laughs> so, well, or, or while he was on space mushrooms, maybe, yeah. <laughs> So it's pretty fair to say that when it comes to pseudoscience, this particular wolf puts the loopy into lupine. <laughs> Lord Cacao, he called himself that? 
as best as I can tell. There's just too many. There's too many things in that one sentence you just told us to make fun of. It, <laughs> chocolate is an octave of sun. Sorry, go ahead. It's too much. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's too much. Well, this is the, this is it, right? Because it, while it's completely fun to point out all the hilariously batshit things that David Avocado Wolf believes in, and you know there are entire listicles and videos dedicated to doing exactly that. It's worth being clear that his commercially advantageous disengagement from reality doesn't stop at the kooky. It follows all the way through and ends up squarely in the dangerous stuff. Yeah, well, and like dangerous on a scale where not really buying this whole gravity thing is the baseline. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. If you can have a baseline without gravity, that is a, that is absolutely <laughs> the baseline. Only one way to find out, David. <laughs> there is there is barely a conspiracy theory that he hasn't signed on to, and then promoted across his huge social media channels. You know, he said, for example, many many times that chemtrails are being used as a form of geoengineering. Oh, geoengineering, like to combat climate change. Yeah. Right, right. And then all we need to do is add a pinch of salt, and those ocean levels would sink back down. Yet we're doing <laughs> chemtrails. Is that what he's? trying to say he's fully on board the chemtrails when flat earth took off he jumped right aboard that train and he, he was still even posting his flat earth videos to his telegram channel in as late as 2019 which is way after everyone else got away moved away from flat earth really and he was explaining you know that nasa know the world is flat which is the only reason they don't turn the hubble telescope around and point it back <laughs> at the earth to show you. <laughs> well i certainly can't think of any other reason they wouldn't do that <laughs> <laughs> NASA didn't build a selfie mode. What are they hiding? <laughs> really? And these conspiracy theories that he that he endorses, they obviously cross right into his alternative medicine beliefs. So he believes that, yep, cancer can be very easily cured by this diet or that product. But Big Pharma doesn't want you to know about any of this because this particular cure is such a simple thing that Big Pharma can't profit from it. But, you know, you too can experience it if you just Mm -hmm. send Wolf some money or (laughs) head to his online store or pay to see one of his seminars. Because apparently the marketing might of Big Pharma couldn't figure out how to turn a profit from a literal (laughs) cure for cancer. (laughs) But apparently David Avocado Wolf managed it. He managed to nail that. Yeah. And the secret is plants, eating raw plants, which are are notorious for murdering photons, are they not? <laughs> Draining <laughs> the sun. Unsurprisingly, Wolf is a very prominent anti-vaxxer. He claimed, quote, a growing body of evidence indicates that vaccines are not safe and that they can injure, permanently maim, or even kill you or a family member. You know, the family member is a weird thing to add. That's to a strange thing that ad. Yes. It can only, only kill yes, you, but is. not your family. But anyway, <laughs> he, he's also said that vaccines are actually the cause of cancer. Mm. And he's he's even gone as far as in, endorsing the debunked lie that vaccines cause autism, but that's fine because autism is entirely reversible by the use of bleach enemas. Yeah. There it is. But I, I would love it if we could all at least agree on rules of thumb. Like, if you're trying to bleach the disability out of a child's asshole, you're the bad guy. Sure. Right. Maybe we don't call it rule of thumb, but yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So it was claims like these around vaccines and autism that saw his 2017 tour of Australia brought to a complete halt amid public backlash, dropped sponsors and cancelled venues. And when you're deemed too dangerous to be allowed near the Australian public, you know you (laughs) fucked up. Some of the signs at those public protests might as well have just been the words go home written on the back of a huntsman spider. (laughs) Which, which, you know, to be fair, that is, that is standard Australian policy on immigration these days. Well, that's true. Yeah. Yeah, Australia. (laughs) You know, it's pure immigrants. Wouldn't want a bunch of criminals showing up from the UK. That would fuck up (laughs) this whole country. It'll be absolutely no surprise to anybody that when COVID hit, Wolf embraced all of those conspiracy theories with completely open arms. He spoke at anti-mask rallies. He claimed the virus was artificially created. And he promoted his own brand of colloidal silver products as the number one cure for COVID. Okay, well, all of this definitely proves that David Avocado Wolf is an asshole. But what marks him out as like a who's who Hall of Famer? So I think what sets him a cut above the average paranoid conspiracist or, or woo merchant has to be Wolf's reach because Wolf is a very prolific poster across all the social media channels, really. He's got a social media strategy that is so wildly successful, it's hard to see it as anything other than nakedly cynical because despite all of the bullshit that I've listed here, and this is barely scratching the surface, you know, some of this is going back decades at this point, Wolf isn't actually banned from Facebook. Far from it, in fact. Right now, his page has more than 11 and a half million subscribers. It is a huge platform on Facebook. And I think most of those subscribers genuinely don't realize how dangerously deranged 
wolf misinformation is because a massive component of his whole social media presence is just farming likes from Facebook's boomer users by posting vapid inspirational quote memes or cute animal photos or warm and fuzzy feel-good stories and then nostalgia-baiting engagement questions like, remember when your teacher could beat you for misbehaving? (laughs) And meanwhile, through all of that, Wolf then runs Facebook ads for his wellness product Empire. And during the pandemic, that included Facebook ads promoting his colloidal silver cure for for COVID on Facebook. He was promoting that via ads on Facebook. Hold on. Silver... Uh, doesn't it have a different octave than the sun energy? <laughs> we all know that would be a golden tenor from the sun, nice. man like voice, something like that. It seems like that would fuck up the cure with the colloidal silver. His mm. story, it's really starting to unravel for me just now <laughs> with this. So the thing is, right, if listeners right now go to David Avocado Wool's Facebook page, I guarantee you'll find friends and family members who are subscribed there. And, you know, many of them might know who he is, but many of them won't. Many of them will just think of him as that guy who posted that cute picture that time. They won't see him as actually genuinely one of the most prolific pushers of vaccine misinformation on the entire internet, or as a man who thinks that mushrooms are from space and that water (laughs) will float away if it's not salty enough because (laughs) gravity isn't real. (laughs) And if your family is anything like mine, you'll also find one subscribed who do know all of that. Fun. Yeah. And as bad as he is on Facebook, and he is bad on Facebook, his Telegram presence is way more sinister. So I spent most of 2021 in Woo Telegram networks, tracking COVID deniers and the conspiracy that sort of spring up from all around there. And I would see more than like a hundred posts from David Avocado <laughs> Wolf, most days, across all the different channels that I was monitoring. Marsh is like, like a... Like a NORAD for liars. I love that. Yeah. <laughs> and, and the thing is, it was on Telegram, it was the same strategic mix of, you know, sometimes cute animal photos and nostalgia clickbait amid memes about ho- COVID being a hoax. And then nestled among all of that were these posts about George Soros or the globalists or the group who claim to be oppressed but actually own all the banks. Ooh, That's a genuine one. I've, there I've it is. Given yep. you it in the notes there. Yep. Yep. And in the last few weeks, just watching his channel on Telegram, it's pivoted to almost constant transphobia, or accusations of child grooming, and claims that the LGBTQ plus agenda is actually communism. And the fact that he just seems to adopt whatever bullshit belief is in fashion and whichever conspiracy theory will get him attention in order to keep sending visitors and fans to his online outlet of overpriced supplements and dodgy seminars, all that means David Avocado Wolf absolutely deserves a seat at the very top table of pseudoscientific assholes. Yeah. Also, he looks like a literal turnip. Like, yes! I want to pull him out of the ground and throw him at a shy guy. In yes! Mario 2. He looks like that. <laughs> look, look him up. It's crazy. <laughs> Essentially, David Wolf is a Californian. He's seen an inexplicable explosion in popularity all around the world. He's got a reputation among many for being green and natural. But when you really get at the center, you find something dark, bitter and unpleasant, which I guess is why he's known as Avocado. (laughs) (laughs) So damn it. All right. Well, with that reminder, why we named the language after these guys, we could wrap things up. But we'll have Marsh back soon for another installment of... Who's Woo? Before we shred this week's script, I want to remind you that Skepticon is going on this weekend in Missouri. A lot of our very favorite people are going to be this year, including friend of the show, Don Ford, voice of fantasy and adventure. So if you're in the area and you're looking for something to do this weekend, you're welcome. Anyway, that's all the blast we've got for you tonight. We'll be back in 10,022 minutes with more. If you can't wait that long, be on the lookout for a brand new episode of our sister show, The Skeptocrat, debuting at 7 a.m. Eastern on Monday, and an even newer episode of our sister show's Hot Friend God Awful Movies, debuting at 7 Eastern on Tuesday. Oh, and an even newer episode of our half-sister show, Citation Needed, debuting at noon Eastern on Wednesday. Obviously, I can't cash this week's check if I neglect to thank Heath Enright for drilling down for the data. I need to thank Marsh for so through the bullshit. I need to thank Lucinda Lusions for screwing. You know what? That format didn't work as well as I hoped. I also want to thank Eli Bosnick because even when he's not here, he's here in spirit, which is a thing that doesn't exist. But still, I also want to thank Sebastian from East Germany for providing this week's Fernsworth quote. That's my second favorite half of Germany, man. Well done. But most of all, of course, I want to thank this week's most scintillating synapsids, John and Tylen, Tracy with a Y, Stephen, I'm here for the knowledge fight, Marco, C. Owens again. I also find Tom Hardy interesting, Lauren, Brandon, El Diablo, Robotico, Sammy Scoop, Yes, Pistachio, Simon, and Tracy with an I. 
John and Tyler and Tracy, Stephen and Knowledge Fight, who are so smart, Siegfried's underlings accidentally got them. Marco, C. Owens, Tom Hardy, Fan, Lauren, and Brandon, who are hot enough to light a joint off of. And El Diablo, Sammy, Yaz, Simon, and Tracy, who are so cool that hanging out with them is technically cryotherapy. Together, these 15 formidable free thinkers favored our fanciful foray into the foiling of faith this week by giving us money. Not everybody has the money it takes to have less of it on purpose, but if you do, you can make a per-episode donation at patreon.com slash scathegatheist, whereby you'll earn access to an extended ad-free version of every episode, or you can make a one-time donation by clicking on the donate button on the right side of the homepage at scathingatheist.com. And if you'd like to help, but I can fuck myself if I think I'm getting your money, that's fine. I was going to fuck myself anyway. Legal services for this podcast are provided by the law offices of P. Andrew Torres, Tim Robertson, handles our social media, and our audio engineer is Morgan Clark, who also wrote all the music that was used in this episode, which was used with permission. If you have questions, comments, or death threats, you'll find all the contact info on the contact page at scathingatheist.com.